Welcome to our third installment of our Misa Salimna's Geekathon. Today we talk about the elephant in the room, Beethoven's ruthless approach to writing for his musicians, orchestral and choral alike. We're going to start with two quotations. One is by Richard Wagner. The Misa Salimnus is a strictly symphonic work of the truest Beethovenian spirit. Yes, it is an orchestral masterpiece, but it is also a work for singers. Except, of course, here is a review from 1980. In creating such an original masterpiece as the Misa Solemnis, Beethoven penalized any chorus that attempted to perform it. It demands sopranos who can sing much of the time above the staff, sometimes at full volume. Not infrequently when the work is done, the air is assaulted by what sounds like screaming and yelping. So let's dive into these two statements. First, let's talk about the orchestra. And I have to say, Beethoven's orchestra is not all that revolutionary. Look at these numbers. Mozart and Haydn symphonies. You know, at their largest, the late symphonies were two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, no trombones or tuba, timpani, and strings. The masses by Mozart and Haydn, slightly different. Mozart Requiem was two clarinets or basset horns, a bassoon, two trumpets, no horns, three trombones, no tuba, timpani, organ, and strings. Haydn, Mass in Time of War, one of his later masses, was two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two trumpets, two horns, timpani, organ, strings. Mozart C minor mass, two flutes, two oboes, no clarinets, two bassoons, two trumpets, two horns, three trombones, timpani, organ, strings. So let's put that in perspective. Beethoven, his symphony number three, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, three horns, two trumpets, timpani strings. Okay, so not, not all that different from what you see above. His ninth symphony, two flutes plus a piccolo. So he added a piccolo, two oboe, two clarinets, three bassoons, but that, that's actually two bassoons and a contrabassoon. So he adds a contrabassoon. Four horns, he adds another horn or two. Two trumpets, three trombones, no tuba. Timpani plus two uh, for the little Janissary band in the, in the last movement of the Ninth Symphony and strings. And then of course, there's the Misa Solemnus. Two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, the three bassoons, two of which are regular bassoons and one is contra, four horns, two trumpets, three trombones, no tuba, timpani, organ, strings. So, you know, it's not radically different from what Mozart and Haydn gave him. He expanded it a little bit, but not that much. It's really how he used the orchestra. And here's what he did. And I'm going to use his, his Ninth Symphony as a comparison. So in the Mises Solemnus, we think of it as this radical piece, but it's really just in line with what he already wrote. So for example, he highlights the woodwinds a lot in the Mises Solemnus. They, they get their own sections quite a bit, and particularly the clarinets and the bassoons have some starring roles throughout. But that's nothing new. Take, for example, this excerpt of the Ninth Symphony.
Another thing he does is he uses the trombones in a way that is not just doubling the vocal parts like it would have been in Mozart Requiem, for example. So uh, in the Mozart Requiem and in his Mass in C minor, the trombones were used in a, in a sacred way as a support for the voices. And so he does much more than that. In the Ninth Symphony, they get a few starring roles. They're not just about beefing up the voices and they're, they're not just about adding bombast to the end. Here's another excerpt, and this is in the second movement. <laughs> Yeah, you can barely tell you they're there. They're just helping the horns out a little bit. So they're not just for church or finales anymore. And then there's the timpani. We're used to the timpani just hitting and, and helping up us with rhythm and final cadences. No, the timpani gets a starring role in what Beethoven does, but it's not just the Misa Solemnis. Here's, of course, the famous excerpt in the second movement of the Ninth Symphony. He has its own character. And finally, how he treats the strings is pretty spectacular. So he asks the violins, for example, to play very high and very virtuosically, even those violins in the section, not just the solo violin and the Benedictus. He asks um, the rest of the orchestra to take a starring role sometimes, so it's not just the violins who are on top. He freeze the basses from the cellos up until Beethoven. The basses were really just doubling the cellos down the octave, sometimes dropping out when the cello part got too fast. But they get their own role in this, in this work, just like they do in the Ninth Symphony. Here's an example. This is the famous Ode to Joy tune. And the basses actually have a separate, distinct melody from the cellos. And the orchestra, you know, to be fair, is really Beethoven's comfort zone. I mean, aside from the piano, it was those instruments that allowed him to really speak as a composer. And here are some ways that really prove that this was his comfort zone. And that is that throughout the piece, the orchestra has the text first and then the chorus comes in. And this isn't about just supporting the chorus. This is about really the orchestra giving us a preview of the mood of the text. So, Curie, measure one, Tutti Orchestra presents the theme. Measure 86, Strings and Woodwinds present the Criste theme. Measure 128, Tutti Orchestra presents the Kyrie repeat first. And the Gloria, measure one, the Tutti Orchestra, that means every all the whole orchestra presents the Gloria theme first. In 232, the flute and clarinet present the Quitolis. Let's see, I could keep going. In 312, 
we get the quonium theme first in the orchestra in 525. The horns one and two present the final Gloria duh, ba, 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 before the chorus gets to do it. In the credo, the winds and brass present the credo, credo before the voices do. The woodwinds present the et bi tam ven tu ri before the unfortunate singers have to do that fugue. And then in 371, the strings present the second e et vitam uh, theme first. Da -da 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 then in the Sanctus, the low instruments introduce the Sanctus before the soloists have their turn. The double basses present the chant-like theme, the benedictus qui venit in nomine. They have it before the tenors and basses do. And in the Agnus Dei, bassoon one presents the Agnus Dei theme before the soloist. Again, the instruments reign supreme. And of course, there are the two key instrumental moments. One, of course, is the Benedictus, the violin concerto in the middle of a mass. And there's the final fugue. And the final fugue, we're going to work on that a little today. Well, we're not going to. We're going to listen to it because the final fugue is instrumental only, as if to say, here's where my comfort is. Here's what I think is important. The, out of all of those fugues that we explored the other day, the last one is instruments only. But let's talk about the voice, since we're all singers. Seriously, what was he thinking? I mean, here are some fantastic quotations. Beethoven, quote, became increasingly ruthless, even as in his composing, in the end, trampling the instruments and violating the sing singing voice. Beethoven, quote, was essentially an instrumental composer and wrote for the voice as if it were insensible of the fatigue consequent upon human efforts. And then a succession of high tones on different syllables is rather unpleasant from the listener's point of view. So Strauss takes that quote from Berlioz and then adds to it Beethoven is in his inspired impetuosity, unfortunately did not avoid this mistake in his choral works. Here are some stats, because you know, I like my stats. So the chorus sopranos are asked to sing from C, middle C to the high B above the staff. A normal chorus range at this point was C to G. Altos go from low, e, low A flat to the top line F and normal for this time was G to C. So to the fourth above normal. Chorus tenors go from C to A, whereas normally they would only go up to a G. Chorus basses go low F to F sharp. I mean, F sharp above middle C, normally they would just go up to middle C. And then that, I mean, all of that is, pretty spectacular, but what makes it even harder is that you aren't just popping those notes every once in a while, you're singing in those notes over and over again. You're singing at the extremes. That's the tessitura. It's where you usually lie. So for example, the et vitam venturi, et vitam venturi, you're just up there for just forever sopranos or the tenors and basses like I call them tenor bears in the unused day are really low in the register and have to cut through the orchestra while being fairly low for a consistent amount of time. Another difficult thing about what he does with the voice is the contour. This is not a stepwise motion a la bel canto singing you got a lot of disjunct stuff here. So it's just lots of skips all over the place. And you're constantly crossing the passaggio or that break between different registers of your voice, like between your chest voice and your head voice or your head voice in your upper range. And then finally, he gives you so many expressive directions that it's nearly impossible to execute them all. So many dynamics and many uh, sforzandos. And here's one of my favorite quotes. This is Mr. Shaw's take. And 
I'm just going to read it because it's worth it. Within the first six measures that the sopranos of the chorus sing, they are given three high A's on the syllables of the word Kyrie. Kyrie! I mean, that's not fair already, but I digress. And in a moderately fast tempo, it is specified that the first two syllables are to be sung fortissimo and the third piano. Almost any A can be difficult, but successive forte and piano A's are an enormous physical vocal problem. It is roughly analogous to asking a ball carrier to change direction while both feet are off the ground. In another instance in the credo, within just 11 measures, which counts 32 syllables ranging nearly two octaves, there are 13 different dynamic markings, forte, piano, sforzando, 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 forte, sforzando, 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 sempre più, Forte, fortissimo, I put seek there because he did put the comma between the pew and the forte, but it's sempre pew forte. And he said, I love this quote, the voice is scarcely a natural swing or sforzandoing instrument. I guess I got my love of statistics from Mr. Shaw. So with all of that in mind, let's warm up, take it seriously, do everything that I ask you to do. We're gonna come back on the other side for some quick tips about how to survive Misa Solemnis. Then we're gonna hit some of these difficult places. Hi everyone. Here is your final warm up for our final Misa Solemnis session. And this is the most important because today we are diving into La Voce and everything that Beethoven did with the voice. So. We need to start how you should start every rehearsal, particularly if you're diving into Misa Solemnis with some body work. So stretch. And I love what Barbara Peters does on her warm up. She stretches one arm up and then she stretches the other like she's climbing a ladder. One, two, feel those obliques. One, two, as our voices age, the most important thing for us to keep healthy is our core because that helps us breathe that helps us support the tone now check your feet or if you are sitting your alternate feet and um just sort of test the weight on either on either foot now i want you to put 80 percent of weight on your left foot all right 80 percent on your right 70% on your left, 70% on your right, 60, 60, and 50-50, and really feel that. This is when you're singing in the middle of Misa Solemnis. You have to have these, these body awareness moments to go back to or you're gonna be wrecked by the end of it. And one of the body awareness things you can do is check and make sure you're 50, 50% 50 weight on your feet. Now, bend your knees back and forth. Just move them a little bit, okay? That's another thing you can do. All right, you find your voice getting strained, stop singing for a second and just bend your knees. Okay, now, arms out like this. Give your Zoom box a hug. All right, now, <laughs> let the air in and push the sides of your Zoom box. Let the air in and push the sides of your Zoom box. Keep those ribs strong. Breathe in one more time and push. All right, shoulders up, back, down. Give me a hang 10. So your thumbs are up and your pinkies are down. Your thumbs are gonna go on the bottom of your ribs and your pinkies are gonna go on your hip bones or somewhere around there. Okay, so you're gonna bend over and you're gonna, your, your thumb and your, four, your pinky are gonna come close together. So you're gonna to bend at the back. Okay. Whew. Okay, now stand up. Okay, now we're gonna do that again. And when we bend over, I want you to keep your thumb and your pinky far apart. So that means you're gonna stick your bottom out instead. So bend over and stick your bottom out and keep the ribs and the hips nice and apart. So you, you'll probably feel a nice stretch in the back of your thighs instead. Now stand up. Okay, now keep your pinky and your thumb right there and breathe in. And when you breathe out, keep your pinky and your thumb apart. Okay, we're gonna breathe into two. 
out to S, S to six, three, four, five, six. Now, relax for a second. This time, shoulders up, back, and down. So you have to keep that rib nice, the ribs nice and lifted and expanded, but your shoulders nice and relaxed. All right, this is another thing to think about. When your voice is getting tight, stop singing for a second. See if your ribs are expanded and they're far apart from your, from your hips and your shoulders are back and down. So just feel what that feels like. You're gonna breathe into two, out to six. Ready? Breathe into two, out to six. S four, five, six. Breathe into two, out to eight. S two, three, four, five, six, seven. Keep the energy all the way to the end. Breathe into two. Don't let it collapse. Twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Stop and relax. All right, sometimes Beethoven's Misa Solemnis feels like that. And you just have to find those last couple of beats in order to, you just got to find that extra tank of air somewhere underneath your third rib. All right. As we go through this warm up, I want you to think about that breathing. I want you to think about that elevation of your sternum, the relaxation of your shoulders, and your balance between your feet. So we're going to go. Think about the sensation. I want you to feel where that hum feels. And I'm going to give you different places to place your hum through your nose, through your teeth, through the back of your face. All right. So much of this work is about feeling where you are and through your nose. Through the top of your head. that sensation through your forehead forehead again and as a Nancy this on a hum. Mm. Mm. Now open up to an ooh, back to hum. Mm. Oh, oh. Mm. So this is meant to be a long phrase. So you're going to need to take a catch breath. And when you take a catch breath, Allow your ribs to expand and allow the air to come in. Don't let it make you tense just because you have to take a catch breath. So starting with the hum, I'll show the vowels. one <sighs> oh, 
Good, relax your head. All right, now, this is one of my favorites. Stick out your tongue. Now go. Yeah, you're just gonna do that on pitch. And I promise not to show this video to anyone. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, <laughs> so this is very spitty and very difficult because it requires great relaxation of your face and great strength of core in order to do it correctly. So watch me one more time. It's with your tongue. And if you give up on your tongue, you can do your lip trill. That's fine too. Just give it like two shots with the tongue and then go to the lips, ready? And for your healthy voice for so many reasons, which I can talk about another time. All right, now here, up here, tenors and basses, you're gonna be in my register, okay? So get your falsetto going. No. go down the octave yet tenors and basses we're gonna go higher now Z keep it in your head voice Z You got it. So tenors and basses, I highly recommend whenever you do this piece that you really spend some time with that head voice. It goes away very quickly if you don't work on it and it's gonna save your voice in rehearsals. Okay, let's start here. Z tenors and basses in your own register. Z Trick on this one, breathe for the higher note. Don't breathe for the lower note. Z it's an easy breath for the lower note. It's a more challenging breath for the high note. Z Z Put your hand on your head. Voice th.
this one we're going to check our our collapsing ribs so here hang 10 rib hip make sure that you stay nice and expanded and keep it from collapsing at the end into chest voice sopraltos more power to you all right good now we're going to start here and remember this we're going to change it up we're going to make it a little bit more difficult okay Gotta work on that run a little bit, right? So go. <laughs> Lots of runs in this piece. I mean, not as many as Messiah, but there are some runs. So now we have to practice rhythm patterns. <laughs> Now I'm going to emphasize the third note. Oh, your turn. Oh, last one, my turn. Oh, now you put it together. Oh, and it should be a little easier. And uh, oh, now we have to get the weight of the. We have to get that heft out of the way in order to do our run. So it's heft and then immediate switch to light melismas. One and two. I don't know if you can even tell, but during that I'm transitioning to a more lifted palette. So I almost feel, I said this last time, like they're butterflies under my soft palette. And if my soft palette goes like this, they crush all the butterflies. Okay. So think lifted soft palette and you can get through any run pretty easily. Z one and breathe. Z oh. Got those butterflies? Z gonna take it um uh we're gonna take it low Good um so if it gets too low drop out or pop up the octave and it's gonna be Glory. 
So nice and legato and sliding down and then articulate at the bottom. And with a good galore, take your hand here and go galore. Now say go. Now say law. Now say galore. So it's Gloria. It's okay if you slide a little bit. Gloria. 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 Embrace the chest voice, soprano toes. Gloria. Gloria. Uh, uh, uh. And tenors and basses, this is where it starts to get, um, it can get lugubrious down in the low register and it can be hard to articulate. So it's very important that you think about uh, 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 articulating down here. Let's see where I was here. One and two. Glory. 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 <laughs> Last one. Glory. <laughs> now the last one is about two things: about going up high and about breathing without collapsing your placement. So let's hear. Gloria, Gloria. See, I take a little breath at the top, but I don't collapse. Okay, let's try it. Uh, ready? Gloria, 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 Gloria. You got to take a breath at the top. Maybe I'll go slower on the up so you actually run out of breath. And now you also have to breathe for the top note. This one is so good for lots of things. You have to breathe for the top note. You have to trans, you have to go over lots of passaggios or breaks in your voice. You have to practice a fast breath without getting tense. You have to get a galo on a high note. All the things that are in Beethoven. Ready? And Gloria. Gloria. Gloria, 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 keep going. Now, when it starts to get too high, you can go down the octave, but realize that Beethoven doesn't give you that option in the performance. In the rehearsal, sure, take most of the piece down the octave, okay? <laughs> Ready? And, uh, Gloria, Gloria, breathe for the high note. Last 
one, whatever octave you like. Gloria, Gloria. I like one more. Sopranos, you got to do that up there a couple of times at least in this piece. All right, so now we're ready to dive into all of the vocal challenges that uh, Beethoven throws our way in this piece. And our job here is done. All right, welcome back from the warm up. Hope La Voce is feeling good and ready. Here are some quick tips. I call them survival tips for, well, surviving the Misa Solemnis. First of all, plan ahead. This is a marathon. It is not a 5K. I have run both. You can sort of do a 5K with just a little bit of training. A marathon takes months. And what's important is that you do not get ahead of yourself. You join a marathon training team and you do your little 5k the first day and then you do your 7k and then you back up and do 4k and then you do 10k and then you stretch and you just have to be methodical about your training. I recommend always warming up and do your warm-ups every day even if you're not hitting Mises Limnus that day. Do a cool down at the end. So Mm, do some nice rubbing of the neck, move your neck around, get your straw out and do some straw phonation if you like. There are lots of ways to cool the voice down, but it's just like a workout. You need to cool down afterwards. Work on your core. Yes, I know I'm telling you to exercise, but it is important. This is what makes it possible for us to breathe properly, which makes it possible for us to keep these two little beautiful chords in shape so that you can enjoy the performance. Also do some yoga. And the reason I tell you to do yoga is this is an 81 to 83 to 85 minute piece and it can produce a lot of tension. And if you do yoga, you are able to feel where your tension is. So you can stop in the middle of rehearsal and readjust. You can take moments during the orchestral interludes and re uh, readjust, find where that tension is and release it. And you can only do that if you're aware of how your body feels at any given time. Take some voice lessons, seriously take voice lessons. I'm taking them right now. I'm taking from Margaret Woods, actually. And we're having a great time and I'm learning so much. Now, learn how to do octave transposition. And in this piece, every single section needs to do it. Usually it's just the sopranos, but I would say every section needs to do it. And we're going to practice a little bit right now. So, let's let's uh, this is how I got good at it is I, I in the shower, I would sing something like Mary had a little lamb. Go for it. Mary had a little lamb. And then I went go. Mary had a little lamb. Want to try it? Two, ready, go. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> or you could do it the opposite way. We had a little lamb. You should practice that. It'll make it so much easier in rehearsals for you to save your voice. Other survival tips, focused listening. Listen to the score, but follow along in your score and just pay attention to specific layers. So listen once and just watch the dynamics go by. Listen another time and look at your highest and lowest notes. Listen another time and just follow along the piano part. Don't try to soak it all in at once. Be very focused. Mark things as you go, as you're listening. And don't try to sing along while you're listening. Really absorb what you're hearing so you can intellectualize what you're gonna need to mark. Start looking ahead practice that art 
of turning the page earlier, of looking further ahead every single time you breathe. Speaking of which, plan your breaths. And I mean, look for the high notes, look at the phrase lengths and figure out how much breath and what kind of breath you're gonna need and mark it in. So if you have a phrase that has a high note at the end of it, mark at the beginning of that phrase, when you take the breath, what kind of breath you need. Do you need that kind of breath with the lifted soft palate and, and the, the strength? Or can it just be sort of an easy relaxed breath because this is an easy phrase? Be very deliberate about how you're gonna do that. Also know your break, know where your passaggio is so that you can plan your break. A lot of us, our passaggios are between E and F in the middle of the, the staff, at the top of the staff for sopraltos. So you can, you can some of, but for basses, sometimes it's a D. Uh, so know that break, know where you go, for example, from your chest voice to your head voice, so that when you prepare your breaths, you know whether or not you're gonna be breathing to get to a, a head voice note or to a chest voice note. And then finally, trust the process. Your directors hopefully are going to create a rehearsal process that is deliberate, where you don't feel like you're accomplishing much right at the moment. But that's okay, you have to trust that because if not, you're just gonna blow it out too soon. Those are my survival tips. And now let's dive in. Start with movement one, the Kyrie. We're just gonna do this opening and we're gonna play Avoid the Turtle. So, <laughs> yes, Avoid the Turtle, ladies and gentlemen. We have this dynamic contrast that Mr. Shaw told us about. It's Kyrie. And so many times we do the turtle, where we go one, Kyrie. And then we go back like this. Don't do the turtle. Instead, think about raising your soft palate and just getting a little taller. So just speak it once with me. I'll do it first. And one. Kiri. And do this. And even put your hand here and raise your palate when you do it. Ready? Speaking it. And one. Kiri. Now sing it. We'll start with the first chord. So here is your D, uh, D. Okay, one, two, one. Okay, now just to make sure you're not getting too tense. Remember that E vowel that we've done before where you put the sides of your tongue on the lower part of your upper teeth. The second one. All right, so here is your D for the basses, your D for the tenors, your B. tenor bass. Now tenors, you might find that you're crossing the passaggio. So rather than bringing the weight of the E up, prepare for the G here. One more time. Two. Now add the, the altos. Almost oh, sopranos, it's so high. Two, one. And now 
for that lovely A. Two, one. Yeah, it's harder than it looks, but let's do it with the orchestra. We'll start about four before letter A. go to the Gloria and we're gonna go to what I like to call the second movement of the Gloria this is the page 26 in the score I gave you uh, measure 230 or the Larghetto I'll give you a second to find your way there this second movement starts with a glorious clarinet solo so we're gonna listen to that in a second but first I want to show you all the things that Beethoven thinks the voice can do. I, and I'm, I love this section because of the variety of vocal techniques that are in it. So we're going to go to measure 245. This is letter K in my score, bottom of 27. You have to go from a, a piano. I, I decided piano, but the orchestra requires it. And you have a crescendo and then a diminuendo fairly fast. Let's do alto and bass together. We're counting in eighth notes. Three, four, one. You just barely put that S on. Not early, please. Thank you. All right, let's add, let's have just soprano and tenor. So that seems like normal choral writing. Let's do it all together. Four, one. Beethoven. I'm not. Let's go to the next section. All right, it gets a little harder. This is letter L, measure 253, bottom of my score, page 28. Let's again, let, actually, let's do bass, basses and tenors together. One, two. Queen. Outrageously difficult? No. Let's have the soprano and altos. Four, one, two. there is that sopranos have a big leap from the F sharp to the high F sharp, but not so crazy. Let's go to the next entrance and see what this Beethoven reputation is all about. 261. Oh, not so hard. Pianissimo, though. All of a sudden he goes from letter K, which is very choral, to a little bit more operatic, 
approach with these big leaps in the basses and sopranos. And now he's taken it back and he's asking us to be pianissimo and under the texture. Let's do this all together. Bass. I'd like you to only whisper it, 100% whisper, no tone. I'll play. Four, one, so. Now, just add maybe 40% tone. So it's so. And you're going to have to take more breaths because you're letting more air escape. Uh, bass. This is the tone you're going to have when we do it with the orchestra. Four and one. Sushi. Be ready for that. That's a color change. Turn the page. Holy bajoli. We've gone from hardly any tone at all to this incredibly tricky passage. Let's start with altos. Measure 269. This is letter M, top of my score, 30. One, two. You notice in my score the pa looks short so I had to write long so you have to count two beats in that let's add the tenors to that four one Queen. and do not put that s early put it right on beat four everyone on the bass part because it's so fabulous Three, four, qui, two, three, four, set as a Now, either sing the bass or the soprano. Now, soprano at the top, you just have to pretend like you're saying words. So if you go, qui, is not gonna work. You just have to look, exude the meaning of the words with your eyes. All right, bass, actually everyone on your own part. Bass, tenor, alto, soprano. Three, four, quick. phrases it's just the counting that's difficult now go back go forward to letter n which is measure 281 2 we have basses and tenors up in this register and remember what i said about the basses often having that d as a passaggio note so what we're going to do is we're first going to ask the altos. This is how I would do it in rehearsal with everybody. Altos are going to sing it. One, two, three. Qui sedes ad dexterum patris. Okay. Now, I want basses to fit into that sound in your head voice. So basses and altos. I'll sing the altos so bass you get a chance to fit your voice in with mine. Two, three. Qui sedes ad dexterum patris. Now we add the tenors to it and the tenors can bring a little um, 
of bravado. Two, three. Qui lot of relying on each other as we get through this piece. Then we have a lot of the same stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing through the second movement here all the way. We'll listen to the clarinet solo, we'll hear the soloist, and we'll come in on each of our varied entrances that show us everything that Beethoven thought was possible in what we do. Here we go. This is measure 230. We'll start a little bit before it. <laughs> Second bar.
Now let's go to the credo. Good job on that. Let's go to the credo, which is in page 50 in my score. We'll start at the beginning, because right at the beginning, it's already impossible. I just want to point out the Sopranos, page 51, measure 17. And yeah, I know alto tenor basses, you feel left out a little bit, but don't worry, you get your chance. But let's look at this. Let's look at it down the octave first. We're going to start at measure 17. Patrem, patrem. Let's try that. Everyone down the octave in your own register on the soprano part. Measure 17. One, two, three, four. Patrem, patrem. that octave transposition work that you did in the shower, your Mary How Little Lamb, comes in handy. You'll start, if I'm a soprano, this is what I'm thinking, measure nine. I'll start maybe at pitch. Until the top of 52, measure 30. Omnium et et easy bilium. So I am all over the place until, you know, hopefully your director lets you go up the octave a little bit at a time, but just save your voice. Those two little chords are too precious to have you screaming your heads off the whole time. So even as we go through this opening today, I want you to think about that octave transposition as much as possible. And that's why I, when I say listen, I mean listen and think ahead. Start practicing thinking ahead. Let's do this opening. And the other, I guess the other thing I want to do before we do this opening is these, these poor basses that have these octave leaps all over the place. So let's look at that. We're going to start pick up to measure 13. I'll play it once. One, two, three. Let's try that. Do Go ahead and do the octave, but do it very lightly right now. Um, do the low notes lightly and your high notes lightly. So it's gonna be no, oh, no sforzando, no fortissimo. One, two, three. Three. Now, what's cool about this, and this is why Beethoven gets a bad rap and sometimes he shouldn't. Yeah, that's hard. But look who's got your back, basses. Look who's got it. 13. The tenors have your back. They are... the same E flat. So you can jump up the octave at measure 13 and find your bearing and then bring on the strength as you're able to. Same thing happens bottom of the page. This is measure 25 beat four. So the, you have the basses here and they go 
but the tenors have that first E flat with you. So you do not need to worry so much about it. You can just listen to them and let them help you. All right, let's do this opening. We're going to start at the beginning. So you hear this orchestra give you that credo theme before you get it. Nice, nice. Now we're going to go to the next section I want to hit or sing, and that is my page 57. We're going to look at this descendit stuff at measure 111 and 112. Again, Beethoven knew what was possible, even though we didn't and probably still don't know what was possible. Let's look first at the alto part because it is the easiest in this particular section. We will start at measure 112. Descendit. 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 Decendis. Let's try it. Everyone on the alto part. One, two, three, four. Descendit. Good. Let's have the tenors. Tenors. That might feel like a big leap down to that low D. But finally, the basses have your back here. Right? So they are doubling you. They're better at the low D. You're better at the high D. You guys can help each other out. All right, tenors. One, two, three, four. difficult tenors, the da because you have to cross a passaggio in order to get that, and you have to be prepared. Can we just start there? The last couple of notes that the tenors have. Da One, two, three. Da Look three notes before it. You have this. The reason that's hard is because you have, you descend, descendit, into the lower part of your range, and then you have to go up. Crossing your passaggio, descendit. But bases have your back. So you can lighten up or take a breath as you go down. And the basses continue it. See, Beethoven knew what he was doing. Let's go um, back to our measure 111. Let's have basses. Basses. I like to ask the tenors to sing that E flat with you for two reasons. One, it helps you. Two, it helps them get that F. And then in the next bar measure 114, they do it anyway. They sing that E flat with you anyway, so they might as well do it before. All right, 
So bases and any tenors who want to help them out, measure 1, 11. Don't push bases because the tenors have your back. 1, 2. Fashion. 3, 4. Fashion. Tenors have your back. Let's have these sopranos. Sopranos, not many people have your back here. But don't worry about the D if, if that messes you up. So what you want to do is you want to get your foot placement. You have a whole quarter note rest to get it. That's not very helpful, Beethoven. So let's start right on it. And let's do it again. Here's the trick on this one. There's a trick for every single one of these. Back up, sopranos. Measure 107. You have this bit, right? Where you have one, two. So that doesn't go up too high, but then you have the B flat. What happens at the end of a long phrase for sopranos, particularly, you know, because we need to always strengthen our cores is that we lose our placement in that breath. We go like this. And then we try to start it over again. Keep the ribs expanded. Keep that placement above the passaggio, which means in measure 107, you have to breathe for the B flat. For the high B flat. You can't even breathe for the G here. Breathe for the high B flat. So it's flat. Let's try it with me. You can just sing into my voice. Okay? Stand. I'm I'm on a stool, but I'll stand with you. Stand. Ribs expanded. Breathe out. And you're going to breathe in for the high B flat. And one. Just keep that placement and that B flat will be healthier, more beautiful, and a little more fun to sing. Let's go all the way back to letter D, which is measure 89, 90. Measure 90 will give you a little bit of lead in into it. Seventy-one in my score, which is measure two, two ninety, two ninety. This is where the altos, tenors, and basses all join the pain of the sopranos. So I wanted to do this once, just so the sopranos had some company. We'll start with the bass part. Now here is where you have to use my survival technique of knowing your 
passaggio. Know your break. This is where voice lessons come in handy, but I know we don't all have time. So you can just do some sirens and sort of know oh, that yodel. That's your break. It's not a bad thing. It just means you have to know where it is. Yodelers use the passaggio to make their music. In classical, we tend to avoid the passaggio, but we need to know the passaggio. If I'm a bass, I'm looking at measure 292 beat four, and I'm thinking that around the middle C to D, I'm gonna need to change registers. <laughs> I'm thinking about that and looks like tenors have your back. If I'm altos, I might be thinking the same thing. I might be thinking that I need to take an extra breath. It's easy for me to do, right? I might be thinking that I need an extra breath there. And sopranos, I have to think all the way, again, all the way back to letter Q, I have to think about the high, high B flat. If I think, Et expect, this is easy, expect then I am out of luck. Think the high B flat and you'll be fine. I'm going to start the music at 287. 287, this is three before Q. I want you to come in at Q and you're going to breathe for your highest note right there. the other day so we're not going to do it. Let's go to the on you stay. Now if you thought that Beethoven put everything in the Gloria in that second movement of the Gloria you're probably right. If you think that the Credo has pretty much everything plus the kitchen sink in it uh, you might be kind of right but then you get to the Benedictus and there's a violin concerto in the middle of it and so you're thinking now that's everything. I think the Agnus Dei is really the key to this piece. It tells you everything you need to know about Beethoven. It starts with the bassoon solo. Again, highlighting an instrument that usually wasn't highlighted during the classical era as a solo instrument. It was more of a baseline instrument. It has this menor chor or this men's chorus idea. And let's, let's listen to that and work on that a little bit. Measure 14. Bases, base two, base one, tenor two and tenor one. One, two, three. come in and say base one it's almost menor core meets opera with that bass solo and you can imagine the opera chorus in the background and then two more characters enter the scene and you have alto and tenor at measure 31.
have the chorus coming in. And more chorus. The soprano, I mean the alto tenor duet continues. And then at measure 57, all of the soloists or characters are in. And then more choristers come in. It's just this incredible incredible opera scene and I can't help but think of the connection in color between what he's doing here and what Verdi did in his Requiem. I think we discount the operatic dramatic nature of, of Beethoven's sacred music because we compare it to the Verdi Requiem which is basically an opera Requiem. Now we're going to turn the page and we're going to get to our first fugue of the Agnus Day, I promised you that we would sing these. Let's look at page 107 in my score. Measure 107. <laughs> I love it when that happens. Look please at the soprano part in measure 107. Let's all sing it. And a uh, one. <laughs> That's your fugue theme, otherwise known as the subject. And here we have a consistent counter subject in the basses. Measure 107. One, two, one. Subject, counter subject. Now, measure 111, we have our answer. One in the alto and one. along with the consistent counter subject in the tenor. At letter F, we have the basses on the subject and the sopranos on the counter subject. One and go. Then the altos have it with the tenor counter subject and one. we have the orchestra we don't have to rely on my hands the whole time so this is our first fugue in the Agnus Day. quite simple let's sing that fugue and we'll start before it at the final Agnus Day of that opera section number one so this is at around measure 91 two three Sopranos. 
Yes, so we have a starring timpani role or a timpani moment. We have trump military trumpets that if if it was a opera, they might be off stage. We have a recitative in the altos. And then the chorus comes in back to opera chorus land. Miserere nobis. One last opera interjection. He's got opera. He's got chorus. He's got metacor in here. He's got a bassoon soul. He's got everything you've ever wanted in a Donna Novis Pachim. And then it goes back to. This theme that starts with, what does it start with? But a descending minor third and an anticipation. Soprano recitative. On you stay, do, and then orchestra. Na. All of those are anticipations and descending minor thirds. He brings that motive back together. Okay, let's take a listen. We're going to start right at letter K. You're going to hear the, the timpani. Then you're going to hear the violas come in. That's right, the violins are not on top. And then you'll hear the trumpets and all of this recitative. And you're going to try to make that miserere no bis. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Timpani. Timpani violas. Trumpets. It's just such a perfect, perfect movement. Go turn the page to until measure 216. This is our second fugue of the Agnus Day. This one is more affected by those trumpet calls and by your shout out to Miserere Nobis. It has a little bit more strength. It has fortissimo. It has forzandos in the orchestra, which we will echo in our bell tones in the dotted quarters. Let's all look at the bass. This is letter N, measure 2, 16, 216. Asking you to be in a tessitura, you know, the high or low tessitura for a really long time. It's those syncopations that make it make it difficult. So watch out for those. And those syncopations are actually anticipations. Right? You're coming to the the note before the downbeat, just like he sets up in the first eight bars of the piece. Actually, in the first two bars of the piece. Look, look at the tenor part, measure 219. I'll go a little slower. One and a two and a do. Part 226. And. Etc. 
Let's sing a little bit of this fugue, then we will listen to that last orchestral interlude, conclude the piece, and conclude our study of this masterwork. Here we go. We're going to start with the about four bars before you come in. Measure two twelve. to the fugue in the end, I want us to say Amen. Amen. Now, sing Amen in an Amen cadence. Ready? And. Amen. Now, why are we doing that? Because that's how we end sacred works, right? With that nice Amen cadence. And this fugue, starting at letter Q, or measure 266, right where we ended, is a little bit of an exception to the fugue rule. Normally, as I said, the first thing starts on the tonic, and then the second one would be in the dominant key on the fifth. So in this case, A major. But here, he goes up a fourth instead. So if you look at the violin, it says violin two in your score. Uh, excuse me, it goes like this. And then the violin one answers. And then the subject comes in again. And then the answer uh, is in the basses. So it's not tonic dominant, it's tonic subdominant, as if to emphasize the amen cadence relationship. Or at least that's my theory, and I'm sticking with it. We're going to listen to this fugue, and then we're going to sing the end. The trickiest part of this is not getting lost in the fugue, this instrumental final statement of Beethoven and coming in on the big cry out in measure 339, 329, making sure you're there and there's a page turn and just terribly difficult because it's in one, but I think we're going to make it. So let's sing, let's listen to the fugue, this Amen Cadence fugue, and let's sing to the end. We're gonna back up a little before the fugue and I'll count down the measures before the fugue starts so that you know where we are.
can't help but think it's deliberate that he chose those specific words for the last bit instead of saying Dona nobis pacem. He says pacem pacem. He starts to leave out the nobis. It's not grant us peace anymore. It's grant peace. This is something that is beyond us that should go forward. And I just, that part always touches me and I, and I, it chokes me up a little bit. All right. Well, thank you so much for geeking out with me one more time on this fabulous piece. If you hit the Zoom room later, you might even see some outtakes because there are a lot from this presentation. I look forward to the next time when we can get together and geek out about a piece. Hopefully it can be in person, but in the meantime, keep singing, keep involved, keep up the community. We've got this, we can get through it. Thank you. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel.